talk about guilt, there's so many facets of it that we could talk about. And since I only have 20 minutes, I'm going to narrow it down and talk about really how, how guilt, why we feel that way, why we feel guilty in regards to our prodigal and how we can choose to respond biblically. That's, that's all I want to talk about. I'll bring in a number of different things, but that's my goal for tonight. In your experience with your prodigal, they're experiencing guilt is almost a guarantee at some point. Uh, it's overwhelming and it's paralyzing. It's overwhelming and it's paralyzing. It's one of Satan's greatest tool to take you out of the game. How many of us, when our prodigals were young and respectful <laughs> and, and compliant, we were involved in ministries or we were involved in the community and we were useful. And now in this season, the prodigals have the chaos that they bring, the being paralyzed emotionally and spiritually. In all essence, we've been taken out of the game. We've taken ourselves out of the game. It prevents us from being all God intends us to be because we are wrapped up in the past. We are wrapped up in how could I have done these things differently? And it negatively impacts virtually every relationship we have. Many of you know my prodigal story. I have a daughter who at the age of 24 was arrested for drug trafficking and spent a year in federal prison. And I cannot tell you how many times over the process of the last uh, 10 years thinking, what could I have done differently? Did I take her to church enough? I mean, I was a pastor. You'd think she was there three times a week. That would be enough. Could I have read that bedtime story just one or two more times to or really drill down and, and provide some conviction in her life. What could I have done differently? What could I have done that I didn't do? And that produces guilt. It produces an environment in my heart and mind that is paralyzing to me. So I want to read, a, I want to read you a, a letter. It's an actual letter that came to Prodigal. And as I read it, I want you to, on your fingers, count... Yep, I heard that. I've heard that message before. Yep, I felt that. Yep, I've, that's been my experience. So here's the letter. This is a letter from a prodigal to a parent. I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm not sure you really get what your daughter has been through for the past six years. By the way, when I read it, I'm going to add attitude. So I've had my assets taken away from me. I've had people steal from me. I've been physically and mentally abused where I've been spit on, water poured on me when I'm trying to go to work. All my stuff tore up. I can go on and on. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed in you, mom and dad. I feel abandoned. I never in a million years wished this pain on anyone. You told me a long time ago that you were sorry for not doing things different with me and my sister, but you still do the same thing to us. We have a we have no relationship with you. I'm your first, sweet father. I know you probably don't remember, but I do. I was daddy's girl. I don't want anything from y'all. I just wanted you to know the pain I'm in. I'm sorry for bothering you. I know you're busy. A prodigal. Whew. I get guilty just reading that thing. But does that sound familiar? Maybe it wasn't a letter, maybe it was just a phone call, maybe it was a text, an email, maybe it was a face-to-face. -face. But they know the buttons to push, and they can produce guilt in our heart because you know what? Deep down, we think we could have done something differently. And you know what? One of the things that I will touch on tonight is maybe you could have. <laughs> maybe you could have. But you know what? God works in mysterious ways. And what we're going to talk about is how do we deal with this guilt in a way that honors God? By the way, how old do you think this prodigal is? Or probably a better question, how many years do you think this prodigal has been sending this marriage to her parents? Any guess? 20 years. 20 years parents have been listening to this message from their prodigal. So guilt, deserved or undeserved, it is not, it is not God-honoring. It is destructive. It skews a proper perspective of who you are, who God is, how God works. It skews it. It alienates those trying to help. It grossly hampers recovery for you and your prodigal. 
Guilt is sinful. Guilt is sinful, and we'll talk about that. All your relationships are harmed, and most importantly, with God. So we ask ourselves, the things that rattle around our head when we we struggle with this is, I did things wrong. I must have done something wrong. Or what rattles around our head, because my prodigal is the way that they are, he or she is, then I must have done something wrong. I don't know what it is. But then there are some of us that say, you know what? I can remember very distinctly losing my cool. I can remember in anger taking my hand and slapping it up against my daughter's bedroom wall and saying, you will take that tongue pierce out of your tongue tonight or you will find somewhere else to sleep. That still haunts me. What else rattles around our mind is we think unless our prodigal comes back from eating the pig slop, unless our prodigal comes back home under the warm embrace of mom and dad, we are a failure. We are a failure. We will always be a failure until our prodigal changes. And it paralyzes us and it captures us in its grips and it will not let us go. But that's not how the scriptures deal with it. That's not where God wants us to go with it. How many times, gosh, how many times at night when it's dark and you're thinking about your prodigal, you think, man, if only I'd have done this. If only I had done this. Think about your prodigal, your experience. Think back 15, 20, 30, 40 years for some of you. When God captured your heart, Think about when God captured your heart. What was going on in your life? Remember that experience? Remember what was going on when God captured your heart and he, in his grace and love, grabbed both sides of your face and pulled, pulled you toward him? Was you, were the things in your life going well? Were you in a good place? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. So as you try to get a handle on and wrestle with the guilt that you may have done or things you might not have done for your prodigal to cause their behavior, realize that God is in control. And we're going to look at some examples of this, but God uses the chaos and the pig slop, the pig pen, to get your prodigal's attention. It's just the way God works. One of my favorite verses in the prodigal curriculum is Luke chapter 15, verse 16. It says, regarding the prodigal, no one was giving him anything. And the very next phrase in verse 17 says, and when he came to his senses. So God is, allows your prodigals to reap what they sow, to experience bad choices. But unfortunately, where we are right now, occasionally, if we, we are wrapped up with guilt and we think it must have been us. It must be us. It must have been something we did or something we didn't do. But in God's eyes say, no, this is my curriculum. I'm the one that writes the curriculum. I'm the one that gives a test. Your prodigal is going to be a prodigal. And you get to model for them what it means to be gracious and forgiving and loving. Guilt leads us to isolation. Guilt leads us to isolation. We won't talk or trust or feel All talk becomes superficial. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. Repeated disappointment leads to no hope of meaningful relationships, deteriorating relationship with God. We ask ourselves, where is he? I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I go to church. I'm in a community group. I read my Bible. I pray. Nothing's happening. I'm doing my part. Why isn't God doing his part? I must have done something wrong. I must not be doing this thing right. The goal in life becomes pain management. And guys, I'll be honest with you. In the early stages of my prodigal's experience, I chose poorly in dealing with the pain and the fear and the anxiety in my heart. Nothing will drive you and I to addiction quicker than the pain of having a prodigal, the pain of guilt. What what could I have done differently? Whether it's alcohol, drugs, sports, getting caught up in your work, staying away from home, (laughs) that's an addiction. You are finding life apart from Christ. And it's about pain management. 
we must feel better. This guilt is consuming. So guys, that's what prodigal ministry is all about. You come here week in and week out. That's what we're pointing you towards is that your relationship with Christ will deal with that guilt, will point you in the right direction. It's about preventing isolation. It's about preventing addictions that may occur in your life and dealing with just feeling better. So let's talk about a godly perspective. I'm going to go 10,000 foot here uh, at first. A godly perspective. God's will for your prodigal's life is eternal life. Okay, I just want to just lay it out there. That's the big picture. God's will for your child or your spouse, if your spouse is the prodigal, is eternal life. John 6, 40. You can read it. It's a great passage. Another godly perspective is that this is a long race. God never works in days and hours and weeks. God works in months and years and sometimes decades. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We wrestle with, not only with our guilt, but also our sense of timing. We think God's got it off. <laughs> but you know what? One of the great passages that I, that I go to in prodigal is the fact that God loves our prodigal more than we do. Isaiah 49, 15, this is not on the slide. It may be in the curriculum. I'm not sure. But it says, can a woman forget her nursing child? Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these, even these women may forget, but God will never forget you. <laughs> That's how much God loves your prodigal. So you can let him go. And the mistakes that you made by... Uh, commission or mistakes you may have made by omission really don't matter because this is God's curriculum. This is God's strategy. You can go to the cross, lay down whatever sins you feel like you've committed or wrongs you've done and find grace at the cross. The blood will cover it. It's a long process. So let's drill down a little bit. You tell yourself, I did not parent in a godly way. Okay, you didn't parent in a godly way. I'm still haunted by a number of things. Slapping my hand on the wall, yelling at my daughter, take that piercing out or you're on the street tonight. Because it was a rule. God's ways are so mysterious. God will work even in the midst of our mistakes. Luke 22, 31 through 32. Jesus tells Peter, says, Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And Jesus said, but I will pray for you so that your faith would not fail. And when you return, Peter, from denying me three times, and when you return, Peter, strengthen your brethren. So Jesus was totally okay with Peter denying him, with Peter being a tool of Satan. I mean, how many times have we thought that about our prodigal? tool of Satan. Jesus was okay with that because of what was going to be accomplished in that moment, in that season of their rebellion, of their rejection, because God had a plan for that. Many of I've read commentator, common, commentators on this passage and says, man, that was, that was Peter's ordination, that failure, that moment of blowing it, but then returning to Christ. I did not parent in a godly way. So what? So what? It's past. <laughs> Even when we think we failed, God is at work. Parents, spouses. Maybe this season you're in. May, you hear this a lot up here. Maybe this season that you're in is about you. That God wants to, you to deal with the guilt that you may struggle with. Guilt of things you've actually done or guilt where you think, I just didn't do enough. I didn't do what I should have done. Maybe this is God wanting to work in you for you to truly understand his grace, that there is forgiveness, there is compassion. And that can change the way you parent. That can change the way you love your spouse and change the way you love your child when you truly understand God's grace and how much he loves you. 
in the midst of, of our crap that we've done over the years. He still loves us. Maybe this is about you. So some of you may think, oh, you know, I thought I did okay. I thought I did everything that uh, I was supposed to do as a parent. I took them to church. I, we read Bible stories and devotions every morning. We had a family altar. How many of y'all had a family altar? I didn't either. <laughs> you know, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go. And what's the rest of the verse? And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know what? Something about Proverbs you need to understand is that that is not a promise. It is a principle. That's generally true. That's often true. To, to bookend that promise in Proverbs 22, 6, let's take Proverbs 29, 1. He who hardens his heart after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. That verse scares me about my prodigal. I pray that that's a general principle and not a promise because my prodigal has definitely hardened their heart. And so we need to understand Scripture the way it was intended to be written, that in especially Proverbs, that these are principles that are generally true. Proverbs gives us wisdom and direction, but does not guarantee every outcome. Does not guarantee every outcome. Scriptures must be interpreted in the light of the entire Word of God. For example, Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will what? He will reap. That principle needs to be lived out in your prodigal experience, your experience with your child. They need to reap what they sow. They need to reap what they sow. That's a principle we need to apply. We all have freedom to choose right or wrong. Our prodigals are alone, alone are responsible for their own choices, right? We're responsible for our choices. They are responsible for theirs. You've got to let go of feeling guilty about their choices. One of my favorite pro Proverbs, Proverbs 27, 22, says, though you pound a fool in a mortar and pestle. Think about that pharmacist. Though you pound a a fool in a mortar and pestle, along with fine grain, throwing some good stuff. Yet, foolishness, foolishness will not depart from his heart. <laughs> you can use every ounce of leverage. You can give them all the benefits you want. But you know what the issue is? Foolishness in their heart. And I don't care what mistakes you made or whatever things you think you should have done that you didn't do. It doesn't matter at this point. Because there's foolishness in their heart, and that's God's realm. That's God's realm. And study this on your own, but the outcomes are determined by God. I believe Jay jumps in on this with his curriculum, so you can, uh, you can look up those verses. Man, there's all kinds of biblical examples that perfect parents do not guarantee perfect children. I mean, Adam and Eve. I mean, really, they were the first ones. They weren't, they weren't tainted by mom and dad. They probably didn't have a father or mother wound. Uh, but it didn't guarantee a perfect child. The children of Israel, they had 613 laws, rules, boundaries to guide them. They had the presence of, of God himself in the temple, in the tabernacle. Traveled with them for many, many, uh, many years. They still rebelled. You got Jesus. He had a small group of 12, and Jesus still had a Judas. Imagine a community group with Jesus as your group leader. Awesome. Maybe. <laughs> it wasn't too good for Judas. You got Paul, the apostle, wrote most of the New Testament. He still had a Demas. Philemon 24, he called Demas my fellow worker. But then he wrote about Demas in 2 Timothy. He said, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for San Antonio. Just keeping you with me. Thessalonica. Doesn't matter your home environment. The issue, foolishness in their heart. Foolishness in their heart that God will deal with it in his timetable. And you let go of the guilt. All right, biblical responses to guilt. We're going to move fairly quickly. We accept God's grace. That understanding alone is, is a perfect place to start to healing. God loves the humble 
and brokenhearted. You will never forget the mistakes you made. Mistakes you actually committed, mistakes you actually omitted. You'll never forget those. You'll never truly let them go. But they are forgiven. They are forgiven. They are forgiven. And we may, you may experience the consequences of choices, their choices and your cho- choices for the rest of your life, but that's okay. I will say this again, but I will, I will tell you this now. Any father or mother wound you think you may have inflicted upon your child is covered by the blood of the cross. The love of God trumps any father or mother wound. And that's true in your life if you have a father or mother wound. The love of God trumps it. And that's a choice your prodigal, whether it's a spouse or a child, will make when God works on their heart in his timetable. The gospel, Romans 3.23, all of sin. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Romans 8.1, therefore there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It's never too late, guys, to go to the cross whether you've done this before in your experience to put your faith and trust for your salvation, your uh, the justification of your sins. It's n- you never stop going to the cross. You never stop going out of worship, out of appreciation to remind yourself that your sins are forgiven. You don't continually ask for forgiveness. You're, all your sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven. When you go to the cross now in your journey, you're just... Admitting, that was stupid. (laughs) That's a sin. But God, thank you for your grace. Thank you that you've forgiven me. Lord, help me to live out a life of worship and forgiveness. You need to accept God's forgiveness so that you can move forward. There's a difference between guilt and conviction. Let's talk about this for a second. Conviction is forward thinking. Conviction is forward thinking. That's where we need to be. We need to be in this area of conviction. God, getting me to acknowledge my sin in order to confess it, we've talked about that already, to accept forgiveness. Once we accept it, we move forward. Can't forget it. Consequences may be all around us, but we receive the compassion that comes with it, and we move forward. One of my favorite passages, Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals a transgression will not prosper. And if you're holding on to guilt, you will not prosper emotionally, spiritually, in your family. But he who confesses and forsakes will find compassion. Wherever you are now, you can take whatever you think you've done or not done Take it to the cross, and there's forgiveness, and there's compassion, and you move forward. Guilt is rooted in pride. Guilt is rooted in pride. It is backward thinking. You're saying to yourself, my sin is so far superior and unique to anyone else that surely God can't forgive this. God can't forgive what I think, I perceive I did to my child. It's unforgivable. And so we hold on to that guilt and you say in your heart, whether you say it audibly or by the way you feel and live, that I am unforgivable. This, and so what do we do? We were talking about this in leaders meeting. As, as parents, when we hold on too tightly to this guilt, we enable, we rescue, we fix because that makes us feel better. It helps us uh, make up for all the things that we think we did to our child. And so time and time again, we rescue and we fix and we think that we're making amends when all we're doing is delaying the inevitable. That they need to reap what they sow. <laughs> they need to experience the consequences of their bad choices. And they need to hit bottom. And they need to get to where you got when you were at your bottom, when you cried out to God, whenever that was in your experience. And that would be a great question to ask in your closed group when that was for you. And to realize that your prodigal needs to get there to that point of despair in their own life to where they cry out to God. And when we fix and enable, trying to make ourselves feel better, it's prideful, it's not accepting God's grace, 
And guys, it just delays the inevitable. Backward thinking, rooted in pride, simply makes me feel bad for what I've done. It's an inability to accept God's will, his provision and forgiveness. It's a lack of faith. It's a lack of obedience. If we punish ourselves long enough and hard enough, it will make up for our faults. Gosh, I remember feeling that way. So in our mission statement, if you're new here tonight, any first-time visitors came in late? Good. Glad you're here. And if you, I'll just make this announcement now. When I'm done, you're going to go back here to this table, my right, your left, with uh, Mary and Lisa and John, and they will get you all squared away on what Prodigal's all about. Um, boy, that was a deflection. Totally forgot where I was. Mission statement. Everybody knows what a mission statement is. If you're an open group, if you haven't gotten to it yet, you will write a mission statement. You will write a mission statement. It, is, it, it will be a guide to you every time you wake up in the morning. What's going, to get you out of, what's going to get you out of your bed? For me, my mission statement is living as a privileged yet unentitled beggar at the door of God's mercy. Living by the power of God to live out who Christ says I am as I abide with him. Resting in God's promises and God's character. That's my mission statement. It guides me. And so our mission statement needs to be filled with conviction, not guilt. You're not making up for anything. But it's, you've, you've realized where you are in your prodigal journey and you're looking forward. How am I going to love God? How am I going to serve my neighbor? What is my mission? What is my purpose? What is that divine purpose God has given me? to do. So how do you know the difference between guilt and conviction? It's guilt if it tells us we are condemned and unworthy. That's guilt. That's sin. It's guilt if it tells us that we have done, uh, what we have done is bad and unforgivable. That's guilt. It's sin. It's guilt if it makes us want to hide and isolate. Guys, that's sin. It focuses us on other Others' opinions of us or your perception of what they think of you. I have a prodigal. Surely they think I'm a terrible parent, so therefore it must be true. It's sin. It's guilt if it makes us, or if it produces fear, it makes us want to blame someone or something. It's guilt if it destroys relationships with others and with God. And guys, that's, that's sin. You take that to the cross It's conviction by the Holy Spirit if it tells us our behavior is wrong, but we are still loved. Isn't that amazing? We can do stupid things and still be loved. We can confess and forsake and find compassion. It's conviction if it gives us courage to ask forgiveness for relationships we've damaged as well as forgive others can't tell you the joy it was sitting down with my prodigal daughter who spent a year in federal prison. She was the one with the tongue pierce. And to make amends with her and say, I am so sorry. I did not nurture you well. I did not move toward you in an intentional way as a father because I was so consumed with me. That was a fabulous time. I wouldn't have had that courage if I had been consumed by guilt. I just wouldn't have done it. It's conviction if it focuses, focuses on God's opinion of us and prioritizes pleasing him above all else. Remember my mission statement? My, that second point, I'm resting in the power of God to live out who Christ says I am as I abide with him. So that's an important part of my mission is to truly understand who does God say that I am? Because my, my version of me up here gets kind of crazy. gets kind of dark if left to myself. It's conviction if it leads to repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation as we don't need to blame. There's no need to blame. Because you know what? God uses it all for his glory. Remember Paul, uh, Peter? Denied Christ. And Jesus was okay with that. I'm going to pray that your faith would not fail. He didn't pray. Peter, I'm going to pray that you wouldn't deny me. He just prayed that, hey, I'm going to pray that your faith will not fail. And by the way, Peter, when you return, when you come back, 
It was a given. Strengthen your brothers. He gave him purpose. Conviction leads us to repentance and forgiveness. And guys, conviction produces joy. The solution to guilt, accepting God's grace and truth. We must fully accept God's grace and forgiveness and conviction. Some great verses there. So let me tell you about the ideal goal. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes on this. No matter where you are in your prodigal journey, your responsibility is to create an environment at home that models what Scripture expects of you, models what Scriptures expect of your prodigal, that models what God wants you to be. So that's, that's your role. I mean, most of our prodigals are older than 13 or 14 years of age, right? Do you have any prodigals that are 13 or 14 or younger? Most of them are older? Okay. That's about the time they stop listening to you anyway. <laughs> Maybe you can remember the date. But they stopped listening to us a long time ago. But we do want to keep that emotional umbilical cord connected with our prodigal. We do want to be the catalyst for change. And so we hold on tightly. Too tightly. And what we need to do is cut that emotional umbilical cord and say, God, they're yours. Take everything uh, that I've done. Take everything that I should have done, didn't do, God. Use it in their life. Make them pleasing to you. And so what do we do after that? Really, we stop counseling. We stop trying to fix. We stop trying to preach. We can do nothing to change our prodigal's heart. All we can do is be a role model. All we can do, stand on the wall. In Ezekiel 33, you will hear that passage a lot in prodigal. Stand on the wall, and when you see destruction coming, when you see the stupid choices of your prodigal's life, say, you know what? I love you, but this isn't going to end well. <laughs> and that's your role, is to warn and to be a role model. So you need to be a role model in following, following God's word. These are some great passages. I'm not going to uh, read them, but these truths, these principles challenge us and uh, charge us to uh, be students of God's word and to model that before our kids. We are to model godly living. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That should be part of your mission statement. That should be what you role model for your kids. And you model community. That you are a role model of saying, you know what, I can't do this by myself. I need to surround myself with people that will admonish me when I need to be admonished, encourage me when I'm, when I'm faint, and I need to be encouraged and to help me when I'm just, at my wit's end. We need community. That's your, that's your charge. Not to fix, but to model. So your child, your spouse, your friend, your prodigal is responsible for their own choices and actions. They need to reap what they sow. You can look back and see what you've done that you regret, that there's remorse, there's shame, there's guilt, there's sorrow. But as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, there is a sorrow that produces righteousness. And that's what conviction is. That's what God wants to do. He wants to produce in you, as you look at, these, at your life, and the things that make you sorrowful, it should move you to the cross and it should produce righteousness and not guilt. And lastly, what you believe about you is the key to overcoming guilt. Let me state it a little bit stronger, but a little bit differently. What you believe about, what God believes about you is the most important thing about you. It is the truth about you. What you believe about what God believes about you. What does God believe about you? He loves you. Died for you. John 3.16. You were a child of God, child of the king, of the king Galatians 3.26. You are forgiven, 1 John 1.9. Man, we are God's children. We are, 
Paul writes in Colossians 3, we are holy, we are chosen, we are beloved. That's who God says we are, no matter what we've done. No matter what we've done. I said it already, but I'll say it again in closing. God the Father can trump. God the Father and our abiding walk with Christ is a trump card for any father or mother wound you think you may have afflicted in your prodigal or any father or mother wound you have experienced in your own life. It's all about moving us closer and closer into an abiding, loving relationship with Christ. And you know what? That may or may not happen in your prodigal anytime soon, but that's God's business. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, help us to understand the difference between guilt and conviction. Lord, help us to let go of this sense that we are responsible for the condition and the choices and the activities of our prodigal, whether it's a spouse or a child. Lord, help us to let that go. Help us to lay it at the cross. Help us to realize that it is prideful to think that things we've done or things that we haven't done that we should have done are uh, unforgivable. And Lord, help us to realize in in your economy and how you work, uh, the mistakes that we made or the things that our prodigal experience are all designed to bring them to the end of themselves and ultimately cry out to you. So God, help us to embrace a, a godly conviction of looking at our mistakes. So Lord, we thank you. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.